From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Data drives nearly everything we do. It helps grow the food we eat, providing farmers with information on weather, soil quality, even shipping information to forecast delays. It can save lives aiding scientists and research teams with analysis on clinical trials and pinpointing disease outbreak. It can capture voter sentiment, predicting election outcomes around the world, and as a result, change how we are governed. But as we sit here in the library of the New York Stock Exchange today, our focus lies on how data and the technology behind it is fueling the financial industry. Our guest today, Lynn Martin, President and COO of ICE Data Services, one of the largest parts of Intercontinental Exchange, and in many ways the connective tissue that brings all parts of the company together. Leading a business which, at ICE's third quarter earnings call a few weeks ago, brought in $530 million over the previous three months, split between pricing and analytics, exchange data, and desktops and connectivity, it's a big business comprising 2,500 people and growing at an annual clip of about 6% at last check on an organic constant currency basis. But how does it drive the economy forward? That's the thread we'll weave into our conversation with Lynn as we dive into the inner workings of the business. We'll also find out what lies ahead for the future of the data industry and how Lynn Martin found herself leading that charge. That's right after this. Arlo is a next generation smart home company that provides a super simple do-it-yourself home security solution with up to 48% market share and class leading internet technology. We're looking at new products and even grow internationally. The NYSE obviously has a tremendous history. The way that they actually bring the stock to market, there was a human element that stabilizes the market and you can see that in the stock opening today. Having a strong partnership to actually bring Arlo as a public company was really important to us. You only get to do this once. It's a home game today in the Ice House as we're talking with Lynn Martin, president and COO of Ice Data Services. Like many of the products and departments she oversees, Lynn came to Intercontinental Exchange through acquisition. She was happily working away as CEO of NYSE Life US, the futures market of the NYSE Euronext, when Ice bought the place lock, stock, and barrel five years ago. As part of the merger, Lynn was tasked with the tall order of integrating the NYSE Euronext contracts into ICE's trading platform, as well as introducing several new fixed income and equity index futures, areas which she's continuing to help grow today. Lynn, welcome to the ICE House. Thanks for having me. Let's start from the beginning. More companies than ever before rely on financial data and analytics in order to effectively manage their risk. I mentioned the three areas of ICE data services segment in the introduction. Why don't you give us a thumbnail for each in words that the average podcast listener can relate to? So start with pricing and analytics. It was $263 million in quarter three. That's right. And I think it was up about 7.5% on an organic constant currency basis. So it's one of our faster growing businesses within ICE data services. The way I'd really describe the pricing and analytics side of ICE data and services is we provide a high quality third party evaluation for everything that's in a customer's portfolio. Things that are in a customer's portfolio aren't just limited to one asset class such as a security. It's everything from a security to its hedge, which in many times is an OTC derivative. It's a compilation of securities such as an index its terms and conditions around those securities, which would be our reference data business. So it's basically everything that is really in a customer's portfolio that they need to trade, particularly in the fixed income markets. The second piece is exchange data. Mm -hmm. If you look at revenue in the third quarter, that's about 146 million. Yep, so the exchange data business is really the business that we 
harken back to when we say we've been in the data business since we were founded at Intercontinental Exchange. Why is that? It's because we've really been an operator of electronic marketplaces. So the exchange data business is the bids, the offers, the trade information, volume, high, low, all of that important information for the lifeblood of Intercontinental Exchange, which is our markets. And the third area, desktops and connectivity services, you total that up for the third quarter, $121 million. Yeah, so desktops and connectivity, I like to refer to as the backbone. What that business does, which is really unique to ICE, is it provides the transport mechanism for our own proprietary data, which were the first two portions of the segment you mentioned. But it also couples that with other third-party data, because as trading strategies have evolved over the years, it's not enough to just provide a single market view to a trader. So our desktop and connectivity business does what it says on the tin. Desktops provide a visualized version of the data. The feeds business provides that in more machine-readable format, providing more than 450 market centers to our customers through a single API. And then our connectivity business is the wires slash wireless business. It's really the transport mechanism. We provide access to more than 600 forms of proprietary and third-party content to the trader. And given the level of cybersecurity that we operate that network under, it's really an unparalleled service to what's in the market. So it's a phrase that we have said before on this podcast. It's almost a cliche. Data is the new oil. Investors using more data than ever. And I'm curious from the perspective of where you sit, why? What makes a critical building block for the financial services industry data? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's a bit of a virtuous cycle when it comes to liquidity. Data provides transparency to add liquidity to markets. The more liquid a market is, the more data it outputs. So there's a bit of a virtuous cycle that gets created as a result of having high quality data available to financial markets. It's all about price discovery. It's about everything from finding where fair value is for a specific asset class, but it's also even in within fixed income, which are the less transparent markets, sometimes about providing available securities for trading. So without information, without high quality information, you don't necessarily have the, the liquidity that we experience in the markets that we operate. The numbers I mentioned earlier for the various parts of the business adds up to 6% quarter over quarter growth. That was sort of the magic number that analysts were looking for from ICE Data Services. And maybe if you looked some of the notes earlier this year and into last year, they wondered if we had it in us. What's been the driver getting up to 6%? I'd say some of the 6% numbers really come from the fact that we've acquired some businesses over the last few years that were more 2 to 3% growers. If I look back at the interactive data acquisition, which was about three years ago today, actually, that we acquired that business, that business was growing 2 to 3% every year. And there was an understandable question of, could we grow that business faster than it was growing? Today, we're growing the core of interactive data, which is the pricing and analytics business, faster than the 6% grower. So from our perspective, it was more creating new products, bringing it into the 21st century, which allowed it to accelerate from a growth perspective, from that 2 to 3% to more of the 6%. And we're going to get more into the interactive data acquisition story in a few minutes. But I wonder, as you talk to people who have been part of interactive data for a long time, do they feel the momentum increase at a run rate of 2 to 3% to now at 6%? What's the difference in the, in the feeling in the hallways? When we acquired that business, it was mainly focused on back office functions. When we acquired the business, though, we knew that it was a business that was ripe to move into the 21st century. A 21st century, someone doesn't want to mark their portfolio one time at the end of the day after the markets have closed. They want to mark their portfolios intraday, and they want to mark their portfolios real-time or near real-time basis. So we've invested a lot in the business since we acquired it, both on the pricing side of the business. So we now price 2.7 million securities globally, real time throughout the course of the day, 
providing traders with a view of what fair value is at any given point. We've got some great quantitative talent in our organization that's really developed mathematical models to enable us to price those securities throughout the course of the day on a near real-time basis. But we've overlaid it with former traders who are our evaluators who really strip out the noise that those models produce throughout the course of the day and add some market expertise to our valuations. That's what we're really known for, the fact that we provide a nice blend of automation, but also the market expertise so that when someone looks at our prices, they know, yeah, that's actually probably about what that bond should be priced at. Bring me back to the beginning, the creation of this thing we now call ICE Data Services, which initially sold data from ICE futures exchanges and got a boost after ICE's acquisition of the organization that you were working for, NYSE Euronext. You started it out at IBM, which is ticker symbol for the NYSE, IBM in the late 90s. What were you doing there? So at IBM, I'm a quant at heart. I'm a quant by background, I'm quant by training. I got my degree in computer science. I'm a reformed programmer, as I like to tell my tech team all the time. So when I started my career at IBM, I was actually writing code. I was in their global services practice, and I was someone that they farmed out to different companies, focused on the financial services to help them write code. Really then that we were focused on the Y2K transition, not to date myself. So I was pretty much focused on recoding systems from two-digit dates to four-digit dates, and then overseeing the architecture that ensued as a result. Then you came over to NYSC Euronext, where you were CEO of NYSC Life US. What did the business look back then compared to the way it looks today? When I had joined the Life organization prior to being CEO of NYSE Life US, the organization had just gone through a fundamental shift from floor-based trading to electronic-based trading. And the face of the trader was very much changing. They didn't need someone to explain to the trader what the individual futures contracts were. They needed someone who could talk to a trader about writing to this thing called an API, which was a new and novel concept at the time. So clearly, the fact that I had a programming background, and by that point, I had received my master's degree in, in statistics, that could sort of talk the talk with the actual coder as opposed to the trader was something that became interesting from a hiring perspective. But those markets at the time were, back when I first joined the Life organization, I think Uribor's average daily volume was about 100K a day. Compared to today? It's, yeah, compared to million today. So it's completely dwarfed where it was. But that's mainly because of the advent of electronic trading. It went from, it really unleashed the capacity in those markets and the global distribution of the markets really unleashed the capacity in those markets. So in 2013, Jeff Sprecher steps in, Intercontinental Exchange buys NYSE. How did that turn your world upside down? Yeah, I love telling people that story because I think it speaks to how we really operate the business and how we look for folks who are cultural fits for the organization. As I got to know Jeff and the rest of the ICE management team, uh, they said, no, you are not going to leave the organization. We would really like for you to stay within the organization when you complete the integration because you are a cultural fit. It's very important for us to have the right culture of people, the right... The Thinking right. back, what were the things that made you a cultural fit? I think some of the things we tried with NYSE Life US, we took some interesting risks around new product development in particular, a lot of which turned to be very successful. For example, emerging markets, the MSCI Emerging Markets Futures and MSCI EFA Futures were initially listed on NYSE Life US, and those are two of our most successful contracts now that they're on the ICE Futures US platforms. Also, just the way we looked at the world, we were really more focused on getting stuff done, getting stuff done quickly, and, and getting products out the door. Bring me through the evolution of ICE data services from there. Let's say 2012, 2013, yeah. up until 2015 when <clears throat> IDS comes. So 2013, ICE closed on the acquisition of NYSE. Middle of 2014, I became COO of ICE Clear US. And then around that time, Jeff started to think about formally making that pivot into the data services industry. I had talked to Jeff about it probably the beginning of 2014, 
but we were still trying to figure out what data services really meant and what it really looked like. Because as you said, we've had the exchange data business and, and we've had that since we founded the company. And then with the New York Stock Exchange came ICE Global Network, formerly at that time known as the safety business, which is when I was referring to desktop connectivity, that's the really the guts of the transport layer that we operate. So the end of 2014, we acquired a small business called Super Derivatives. And I'd say that was really when we started the pivot into becoming a data services organization. And then we made the decision to formally set up ICE Data Services mid-2015. And then as you're looking around the landscape for something like the super derivatives business, are you doing the due diligence there? Are you thinking about what kind of a integration fit it will be with what you're trying to put together? There was a lot of things that were interesting to us about super derivatives. Number one, getting the quant expertise that super derivatives had, we thought could be really useful, not just from a pure business standpoint, but also given their background, it would be very analogous to some of the work we do in the clearing houses and the modeling work that needed to be done to manage risks in the various clearing houses we own and operate. So that one was a really attractive acquisition to us because it had multiple utilities for the organization. It wasn't just a good business on its own, but it also brought a pool of talent that we could leverage in the clearing side of the business. Then the big gulp comes yep. in 2015. ICE buys fixed income data provider Interactive Data Corporation. The price tag, $5.2 billion, if I have it right. Another big money bet. What did you want to do with IDS when you got it under your roof? The first thing, which uh, it sounds simple, but it was not simple, was really to integrate the businesses. I mentioned how at ICE we're very focused on our culture, and we... As a result of buying IDC, we bought a company that had 2,500 people. It takes a long time to get to know 2,500 people. Bringing it together, number one, and trying to integrate it from a cultural perspective where you had the right people in the leadership positions. The second thing was really, it became apparent to us during diligence on that deal that the business had significant potential just with a little bit of investment in a few key areas. So it was fast identifying what the low-hanging fruit was in terms of investment and hitting those really early on, getting the investment dollars in to really start to grow those businesses and morph them into um, the businesses they are today. The businesses they are today. Let's look at the whole engine of ICE for a minute. 12 regulated exchanges from here at the NYSE, the Chicago Stock Exchange, which we acquired this summer, ICE Futures US, ICE Futures Europe, and NGX, just to name a few. That engine throws off a lot of exhaust in the form of proprietary data. Mm -hmm. It's really just a fraction of the data in the business that you run. But for that part of the data, how do folks use it and how does it help grow this business? Yeah, so the exchange data business itself is probably about roughly $500 million of annual revenue, which is about 25% of overall revenue, so about 12.5% of ICE Group's revenue. That business is used in a few ways. It, it really is very integrated, as you would expect, to the trading businesses. It not only provides important information about high-low indicators, which may trigger different market events. It provides bid offer information, trade information, all that good stuff, which informs traders as to where to find their next trade or for, for price discovery purposes. Within the bucket, though, within that $500 million, the data revenue that is generated from the U.S. equity markets is a relatively small portion. It's, it's about $200 million worth of revenue. So about 10% of overall revenue, about 5% of the group's revenue. You also offer reference data and evaluated pricing for the fixed income markets. If I were to try to translate that into plain English, you put a price tag on millions of bonds. We were talking about that earlier. Had that been a dusty corner of the financial industry in need of some sprucing up? I mean, I think the fixed income markets are ripe for innovation. I don't think anyone would disagree for that. The fact that the market trades the way it does, someone just hearkened back to 1955 and a market that's still trading like it's in 1955. I think that the problem with the fixed income markets is a share of IBM is not the same as debt 
that IBM issues. A share of IBM is a single thing. IBM issues hundreds of bonds. So you've got to find a price for those hundreds of bonds as opposed to a single share of IBM. There's a variety of ways to, to do that. And it's not enough to just provide those prices on an end of day basis. That's the bit that we've really transformed to move into the more real time side of the business. How do you use the pricing and proprietary data that we get to build new products and services that market participants are demanding? Take me in real time into the R&D shop of ICE. Because we have such a broad stable of proprietary data, we can create all forms of derived data on top of that. Derived data can mean a lot of different things. It could be an analytic. It could be another valuation. It could be something that is used as the base to set a model that could then create additional information for customers. When we're looking at creating derived data, we're going to look at a couple things. We're looking at Number one, what are our customers need at the moment? Regulation, for example, has been a huge tailwind for us over the last couple of years. And it's allowed us to create an awful lot of additional derived data, which customers are very interested in and have found a lot of usefulness in. Some products include our MIFID II service, our best execution capabilities, more recently our liquidity indicators, Each one of those is really using our core evaluations and our core proprietary data as the base. So we're using the base to create something new and innovative to bring to customers to add value to their portfolios. I'd say probably the one area that's been incredibly interesting from our perspective that that we've created over the last um, couple of years is really the index business that we've built. So... We had a suite of indices which customers were using to benchmark their portfolios against on a variety of asset classes, some smart beta indices, the U.S. dollar index. And then last year, we announced the acquisition of the Bank of America Merrill Lynch suite of indices, which really completed the asset classes that that we had under our umbrella. It brought to us about 5,000 indices, mainly fixed income, but also commodity indices. And the nice thing about the fixed income indices is they all already used our evaluations. That project was a great project for us because not only were we able to showcase our evaluation quality, we also replaced another third party from a reference data and an analytics standpoint with our own proprietary reference data offering and our analytics offering with zero disruption to the indices. And that business has significantly grown since we closed on the acquisition in October of last year. At ICE's third quarter earnings call a few weeks back, the founder and chairman and CEO of ICE, Jeff Sprecher, had some pointed thoughts about our nation's equity markets, reacting to questions that some have had on the role that market data plays in our exchanges. Let's take a listen. Markets offer the most advanced trading and most transparent data services in the world services that are critical to market efficiency, resiliency, and security, and why the cost to trade U.S. listed equities is the lowest in the world. Today, price information is available equally to retail investors for little to no cost, a direct result of competitive forces across the brokerage and exchange marketplace. And in fact, we believe that the NYSE data costs to the top five Wall Street banks is less than one half of 1% of the nearly $26 billion that they've generated in their equity-related businesses just so far this year. This is in stark contrast to the state of the equity markets only a few years ago, a state in which the exchanges were owned by many of those same banks and brokers. And when access to data and information was discriminatory, against those who were not the exchange owners. It was an era that many falsely romanticized. An era that many falsely romanticized. Lynn Martin, you and I were talking recently in Chicago about what Jeff was talking about on that call, how many folks overlook this key linkage between the way exchanges operate today and the value that the granular data that we create provides to those making algorithmic trades on behalf of large institutional investors, the pension funds, and others who are helping build the retirement nest eggs of teachers, police officers, firefighters, and others. 
Where is the disconnect? How should people be looking at this? Well, I think there's two things here that are getting a bit missed. Number one, the goal many years ago was to drive down the cost for the retail investor. That goal has very much been achieved. I think the focus on U.S. equity market data is a bit picking on one piece of the value chain that has caused the retail investor to have the lowest cost possible. It's not looking at the entirety of the ecosystem that operates what we wanted to do 10 years ago with Reg and MS. So, you know, I've heard Jeff and I've heard Stacy make this statement, but I'll make it as well. I mean, this is very much not about Main Street. This is a Wall Street debate, and we're picking on one piece of the ecosystem that folks have some objection with from a cost perspective. It, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. The other thing that I think is really getting missed here is the cost to the firms created by fragmentation of markets. No one's really talking about Explain fragmentation that. of markets. So Reg and MS introduced the requirement to route to the location where a trade would receive the best bid or offer, depending on what you were you were doing. As a result of Reg and MS, many firms, in order to stay competitive, need to connect to multiple venues to evidence either the best bid or the best offer has been given to the investor or to see what the full stack of that exchange's bids and offers are. Connecting to 13 different venues in the U.S. comes at a cost to a firm, but that's a cost that's been imposed by the regulation. It's a bit of a side effect of the regulation, but that's really the debate that folks should be having. Has fragmentation, has Reg and MS driven the cost to the end user down, but introduced a whole different level of cost as a result of fragmentation? Not the cost of one little part of the ecosystem that has driven those costs down. And much of that debate sort of laid itself out recently at the Securities and Exchange Commission, a two-day roundtable on market data. And I think what resulted in that was a realization that it's not just the exchanges. It is these other market participants, very much a Wall Street versus Wall Street conversation, a discussion of where profits lie, not whether the Main Street investor is being parmed. I mean, for them, all the data that they get and they really need is almost for free. It is. I mean, pull up your phone right now while we're talking. We'll see where the ICE stock closed today, and it'll be for free. You know, if we want to trade on that, we can probably tap an app and trade on that. So that's a great thing as Lynn Martin, the retail, and Josh King, the retail investor. So when we say it's a Wall Street debate, it very much is because the folks at the table are the exchanges versus the Wall Street firms. After the break, we are talking more about indices, what makes them so important within the data business, and why increased regulation will require more data than ever. That's right after this. Elanco has been in the animal health business for over 64 years. We're all about the care and the well-being of animals, it's making pets as well as livestock live longer, healthier lives. We've been launching three products a year since 2015. We've added almost 20% to a pet's life. We're coming into an IPO with a portfolio of innovation. The New York Stock Exchange, just like Elanco, brands matters. Behind brands are people, cultures, and quality. Elanco, now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Back now with Lynn Martin, President and COO of Ice Data Services. As we were just getting started in our conversation, Lynn, you talked about your quantitative background, and you certainly mm -hmm. have the cred, a BS in computer science from Manhattan College, a master's in statistics from Columbia, perhaps not the predictable path for a woman from Brooklyn. What was your upbringing like? My dad was an electrical engineer. He actually... He's a quant at heart, too. So he always sort of pushed me in that direction. How did he get his quant background? It's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. It was just stuff that came, I guess, not easy to him. It was just stuff that more intrigued him than anything Who did he work else. for as an electrical engineer? Oh, he worked for basically any firm that serviced the defense industry, everyone from Raytheon to Lockheed Martin to Grumman to a variety of folks. All in the New York area, he'd move around a lot? He moved around a lot. His first job was actually down at Cape Canaveral. He worked on the Polaris missiles, which I thought was pretty cool. And then he moved over to California and he moved to Boston and then back to New York. 
Was home like a math class for you? <laughs> no, but when I didn't do well in math, I heard about it. I'll assure you of that. Was it a little uncommon for a woman to follow the path of your dad into being a quant? You know, when it came time for college and we were trying to figure out what my major was, I didn't, I mean, what college kid 100% knows what they want to study in college? I certainly didn't. So I, we were filling out college applications and I said to my mom, what should I do? And she's like, I don't know, maybe finance, maybe economics. My dad's like, why don't you do computer science? I remember him saying to me, you should look at computer science because there are women in that field, or there are starting to be women in that field. He, didn't, he turned me away from following in his footsteps and going the pure engineering route. So he didn't see a lot of females in his field doing circuitry and things of that nature. So I have my dad to thank for uh, the kick over to computer science initially. I mean, he also had an incredible work ethic, didn't he? He did. He worked six days a week until he was 70 years old, and he worked 12 hours a day during those six days a week. I think, although I think on Saturdays he only worked five hours, but every every week it was every day except Sunday he went into the office. There wasn't things like telecommuting back then, so he did seven to seven five days a week, and then nine to two or three in the office on Saturdays. Leadership also counts for a lot. Many of us were captivated by the dramatization of female mathematicians from the 2016 film Hidden Figures. Here's Taraji Henson as NASA's Katherine Johnson lecturing a room of men on Euler's method. The problem is when the capsule moves from an elliptical orbit to a parabolic orbit. There's no mathematical formula for that. As we can calculate launch and landing, but without this conversion, the capsule stays in orbit. We can't bring it back home. Maybe we've been thinking about this all wrong. How's that? Maybe it's not new math at all. It could be old math. Something that looks at the problem numerically and not theoretically. Math is always dependable. For you it is. Math is always dependable, Lynn. <laughs> Just like your dad in the Polaris <laughs> missile program, there's, there's Katherine Johnson working on the Mercury program. As you help pave the way for other women in financial data services, what was it like trying to break through the boys' club? It was interesting. It was interesting going through school, particularly college and grad school, being one of, if not the only, female in classes. But quite honestly, that made me probably work harder than some of the other folks. It wasn't one where you were going to meet a lot of friends, although I do have some friends from college that were in my program. But it was one that, if anything, I knew I had to be better than the next person. So it was one that in some ways motivated me. Did you have any mentors when you were first starting out in your career? When I first started out in my career, I had a mentor at IBM who was a female. She was one of the first project executives I worked for. And she had a team of, I think, 40 of us that she shepherded through a Y2K project for J.P. Morgan, actually, at the time. And I was amazed at how she kept the project moving, kept us all accountable to our dates, and also her command of the actual technology that was underpinning our project. Outside of the business that we've been talking about, I mean, data plays such a huge part in our lives. You and I both ride Peloton. Here's one of Peloton's TV spots. If you're at home, you may have seen it. Okay, Peloton, let's do this. Rachel in London, I see you. Let's see what you've got today. David in Edinburgh, that is 200 rides. Let's make it count. Do not give up now. Let's go. Let's climb together. Here we go. You are stronger than you know. Smashed it. That's a 45 minute workout. Peloton, a company that could go public in the future, mm -hmm. at a group class or in the privacy of your own home, yet all the data of your own exertion stacked up against thousands of other riders from around the world. And that's the greatest thing because you're pushing yourself. You see where you are on the leaderboard. So you not only are you competing with other people when you're in a live class, but you're also competing with yourself. So that's the thing that actually makes Peloton special and that it's got that personalized metric about you. It tells you what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, 
when we're good, when we fall short, sort of a metaphor for a trader looking at their screens from the ICE Global Network. Yep, that's right. In just two decades, Intercontinental Exchange has grown from a small energy trading platform to a global data and exchanges, commodity and financial markets, and technology and clearing infrastructure with over 5,000 employees worldwide. How do you grow like that and stay focused on the mission? You started out at IBM. Let's go back and listen to the chairman of IBM at the time, Lou Gerstner, talking about changing a company's culture. Changing culture is really hard, and it's not about uh, communications. You don't, uh, when I got to IBM, the first question I got from almost 60,000 people in the first three months was, hey, Lou, the culture here stinks. What are you going to do about it? I said, I can't do anything about morale. What I can do is make the company better. And if we make the company better, then your morale is going to go up. So let's not focus on morale. Let's focus on beating our competitors in the marketplace. And so changing culture is about looking at every single process in the company and saying, does this process line up with our strategic intent? So my strategic intent was to integrate, to provide solutions. That meant we had to be able to integrate inside the company. Well, it turned out, I said, how do we pay people? Oh, we pay people on individual performance. Well, how can we have teamwork <laughs> if everybody's being paid on individual performance? Does Gerstner's philosophy translate into ICE? Absolutely. I mean, he said culture. Culture is the first thing, and I agree 100%. That's why we're so obsessive about our culture. I think we have a great culture at ICE, I and mean, we're so obsessive about maintaining that great culture. I think everything he said is pretty much similar to what we're doing at ICE Data Services. One of my jobs is to really give our team new products and new ideas to deliver to the market. It's one of the things my management team on the product side and I obsess about is how are we evolving this business? What new products can we bring to the market that are complementary to a customer's workflow and to the way the customer operates that allow them to gain efficiency. It's a very different conversation when you're talking to a customer about how you're helping them as opposed to you need to buy something, okay, I'm going to charge you the highest rate possible. I never want to have that latter conversation. I want to have the conversation of how am I adding to your business and making your business more efficient. A key facet of ICE's growth strategy is the index business and its role within pricing and analytics, Lynn. People generally have a sense of what indexes are, but perhaps not the inner workings and how they use data to function. And this summer, it was announced that ICE had been selected as the new benchmark provider for four of BlackRock's iShares U.S. bond ETFs. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager with $6.29 trillion in assets under management as of the end of last year, also just announced it had selected us as the benchmark for another ETF, which represents over $16.4 billion in assets under management. Walk us through the importance of ICE being selected as benchmarks for these ETFs and what they mean. First, I'm going to give an oversimplification of what an index is and why we're well positioned. Effectively, an index is a compilation of values informed by some weightings and outspits an index value. That's my oversimplification. If you look at the fixed income indexing ecosystem, you've got the valuations, which is our evaluated prices, which was the guts of what we bought in IDC and what we've now transformed to not just be end of day, but real time, informed by some weightings. The weightings are our reference data. Now our reference data business, we have invested a lot in over the last three years. We now have high quality reference data on more than 11 million securities globally. And that information is very much used as the basis to inform the weightings that are applied to the valuations I mentioned earlier. And the last bit, which again, I'm going to oversimplify, is the analytics on top of it. What price yield calculator do you use, for example, to, to inform the index? What option adjusted spread are you going to use? There are a variety of analytics on top of the valuations and the, the weightings component that actually form the index, all of which is provided by ourselves. So it's it goes back to that base form of proprietary data and that large base of proprietary data I mentioned earlier as really the core of, of our business. BlackRock choosing us 
was tremendous from our perspective because it really did two things. Number one, you mentioned the BlackRock's size and scale. The amount of AUM that's moved over from those five indices is, you know, close to 40 billion, which is not a small amount. But it also showed that the largest asset manager in the world, in partnership with us, can actually perform a transition from index provider A over to our indices. Index transitions aren't done very frequently, but we proved with a high level of accuracy that that was not going to be an issue. The most recent transition, the PFF ETF, from our perspective, that's really interesting because that's not just about a cost play. We designed an index in partnership with BlackRock, a a nice index, to allow them to have the capacity to further grow that ETF. That's why they selected us, actually, is because of our calculation methodology, our constituent selection of really the IP that we put behind the index. That's really why they made the decision. It's going to allow their ETF to continue to grow. So we're excited because it speaks to the quality of our indices. It's not just about a cost play. It's about the quality of the index as well. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that new regulations were one of the factors driving the increased use of data, not just in the U.S., but Europe as well. Share with us how ICE is helping its customers with regulatory compliance and the new liquidity rules of MIFID. As I mentioned, regulation has really been an enabler. It's been an enabler for us because it's actually enabled us to reach a whole new customer base that we hadn't previously dealt with. Enabled us to service our existing customers, sure, but it also enabled us to to reach out to new customers. We've really had multiple regulations. I get asked this question a lot, actually. We've had multiple regulations which we've helped customers comply with. Started with MIFID II around this time last year in EMEA and customers seeking to comply with MIFID II, although some U.S. customers also faced that. This year, we really focused on compliance with Form Nport, which was an SEC form that the mutual funds needed to complete. That went live at the end of June. The liquidity rule firms are starting to shadow report starting at the end of the year in anticipation for full compliance next year. But then next year, we're going to be focused on additional regulations. FRTB is one we're really focused on in Europe which is affectionately also known as Basel IV. So there is more and more regulation that requires regulators to have transparency around what is in a customer's portfolio, not just the assets that are in a customer's portfolio, but what is the profile of that portfolio. In an extreme situation, how quickly could they liquidate that portfolio, for example? All of that to me is data-driven trends which require additional forms of data. You're a member of the SEC's Fixed Income Market Structure Advisory Committee, which is working to improve transparency and liquidity in bond markets. What are the conversations you're having there, and is there anything we can learn from that process that could be applied to the equity markets? I think the SEC FIMSAC committee that you rightly point out I sit on has been a very forward-thinking move by the SEC to really look at one of the biggest markets in the world, the fixed income markets, and try to figure out what can be done to enable more liquidity to come into those markets. It's a realization that the world looks a lot different today than it did pre-financial crisis, particularly as a result of the various challenges on banks' balance sheets. So I think the SEC is being very proactive in looking for ways to continue to add liquidity to these markets, given the capital constraints on the banks. We are a very active participant on that committee. I think some of the recommendations we've come out with thus far have been beneficial for the markets. So we're looking forward to a second year. A lot of people can throw darts at the SEC, but you're of the view that this is one area that's really working. Yeah. As someone who spends a lot of time with them on this committee, I'm I'm chair of the Muni Transparency Subcommittee actually, so I spend quite a fair amount of time with them. They really want to hear what the market's thinking here, and they seem to be more inclined to pursue market-driven solutions as opposed to regulatory mandates, which is refreshing to hear. 
Earlier, we mentioned the ICE Global Network. It's a pipeline for financial and commodity market flow, a consolidated feed that provides constant access to global markets. How have these services evolved since combining the NYSE safety network with interactive data networks and feeds and Atrium, which you acquired from TMX Group. How are these services being used by ICE's customers today? So the safety network, when it was acquired in 2013, is really the backbone for ICE Global Network. That was a network that at the time was primarily focused on providing high quality, resilient, reliable transport services to the exchanges of the New York Stock Exchange. So those were the New York Stock Exchanges, exchange as well as the life markets, and at the time, the Euronext market. Since we acquired the New York Stock Exchange, we've greatly expanded the content available on that network. So today, there are more than 600 forms of data available on that network globally. We've expanded the footprint of the network. At the time, it was primarily focused on the U.S. with some tentacles into Europe. Now we've got tentacles into Asia, so it's a fully global network. And then some of the solutions that you mentioned that we've acquired through acquisition, specifically the TMX Atrium network, have really expanded the different types of services available. So we're no longer just a wired network. We now have wireless capabilities, fastest routes to to Canada. We've got a route to Chicago. And then recently last year, we signed a partnership with a group of end user firms to supply the fastest link into the Far East, into Japan. It was called the Go West partnership. So as I sit here today, It's a network that's got a variety of options for a customer to plug into. We've got variable levels of bandwidth available, which allow a customer to really tailor the type of connectivity they have to us. If they're the most latency sensitive customer, they're going to take wireless from us, and they can get more than 600 forms of content. Now, when you think about how that network started, going back to being the network that powered the New York Stock Exchange, it's got a whole different level of cybersecurity on top of it, which in this day and age is something that very much resonates with customers. They'd rather have fewer connections that they know are secure and reliable than the spaghetti they had in their comms rooms in the past, which is why more and more customers are consolidating their connectivity with ICE Global Network. We've covered pricing and analytics in this conversation. We've covered exchange data and indexes, and we've covered the ICE Global Network and the consolidated feed. How about next-gen technology? Is ICE embracing artificial intelligence, the cloud, and other new cutting-edge technologies? Yeah, I mean, on the cloud side, we're looking at how we partner with the cloud for things like tick data storage and things of that nature. I think the cloud is still being looked at with a little bit of kick gloves as folks are are still figuring out how to best make leverage of the cloud and its storage capabilities. So that's where we're really starting to leverage it as well from a storage capability for our historical data services. Artificial intelligence, it's a great question. It's one of those many buzzwords in the data industry that people love to talk about. A lot of times when people talk about it, though, they don't really have examples to back up how they're using artificial intelligence. We've got this proprietary instant messenger application called ICE Chat. When we first started ICE Data Services, it had about 30,000 users, 35,000 users in the directory. As I sit here talking to you today, it's got 93,000 users in the directory. It's got the entirety of the energy and commodity ecosystem in this directory. So price discovery for the entirety of the energy, commodities markets, and increasingly the equity derivatives and equities markets is really taking place for the more OTC stuff through this mechanism. The neat thing about it is we have artificial intelligence built into it. It knows, Josh, if I'm talking to you about last night's Peloton ride, or if I'm talking to you about a WTI call option. It ignores if I'm talking to you about the Peloton, right, because it doesn't really care. But if I'm talking to you about that call option, it will automatically populate Greeks, what we determine as fair value for those Greeks, and it allows you to simply click 
on the quote, if it recognizes it as a quote, and submit it to the ICE clearinghouses. So I think that's a great example of how we're actually implementing artificial intelligence and those types of strategies to create the next generation of analytics for us. If you were a market participant, Lynn, without a complete package of data services from ICE, looking ahead to the new year, what would you most want for Christmas? I think the one thing that is our customers are, are starting to use is this artificial intelligence thing I mentioned in ICE Instant Messenger. I think that's going to be an area that you see us talk a lot about in the future. I think the index business, I think the reference data business, actually, the way the reference data business was once described to me was the most boring form of data. And I said, no, 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 I, I don't care if it's boring. It's the most systemically important form of data, which is why we invested in it in 2016. Terms and conditions associated with corporate bonds is a gnarly business. And we've figured out a clever way to electronically deliver that information into customers' back offices and middle offices and front offices, because quite frankly, you need those terms and conditions in order to trade the security. It won't be set up on your security master if you can't get those terms and conditions as soon as a bond is issued. So those are areas that I think you're going to hear us talk a lot about and we're talking a lot to our customers about. Sifting through a gnarly business, a perfect Christmas gift from Intercontinental Exchange. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lynn Martin, for joining us Thanks, on the ISS. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Lynn Martin, president and COO of ICE Data Services. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at NYSC. Our show is produced by Teresa DeLuca and Damon Level with production assistance from Ian Wolf and Ken Abel. I'm Josh King, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. 